it's a, a delight to uh, welcome you back as we're continuing our studies of the New Testament book of Romans, this great letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. We are arriving this uh, occasion at chapter 6. Chapter 6, and we're going to cover about the first half of chapter 6, and then we'll go ahead and proceed from there in our next session. You recall that the argument that Paul is making along the way here is first of all that we are all in a very unhappy state which I'm calling the bad news in the book of Romans and then that's set in contrast of course to the good news which begins at chapter 3 verse 21 and the first theme that Paul has taken up in connection with this good news in Romans is what's commonly called in Christian vocabulary justification justification, which has to do with the notion of being put right with God, being disposed before Him in such a way that I am no longer accountable for the sins that I've committed. I've been justified. Of course, if God were simply to wave His hand and say, okay, I forgive you, without any other action being taken, the problem with that would ultimately be that it would make God unjust. God must be just. As Paul indicates in chapter 3, verse 26, God must be just. And the great dilemma is how can God be just and at the same time justify? How can he maintain and preserve his integrity so that there's no tarnish, no blemish on his perfect holiness and at the same time bring anybody into heaven if that person that he's bringing into heaven is a sinful person? because sin must be judged by a holy God. That's the great dilemma. How can God be just and the justifier? And of course the answer that Paul gives as the, is the classic answer that's been provided down through Christian history based on biblical teaching is that Christ absorbed the wrath of God. That that judgment that I deserved was poured out on him. He became my substitute, hence the phrase substitutionary atonement, vicarious atonement. He stands in my place, absorbs what amounts to my eternity in hell, does it in finite time as he's there hanging on the cross, and he can do that because he is not only God, he's also man. He is God having the same holiness, the same majesty, the same integrity, the same virtue of God, and yet at the same time he can stand there as man in my place because only a man could pay that debt. The God-man, Christ, truly God, truly man, accomplishing the atonement. And on that basis, we have this wonderful news that there can be a satisfaction of God's justice. God can be just and at the same time justify. And that's the great, wonderful truth of justification. How do we avail ourselves of this benefit? How does it become ours? It is through something that Paul calls faith. Faith becomes that organic link connecting my heart to the grace of God. God awakens faith within us by His grace. Grace and faith are inseparably connected. In a sense, the mirror in my heart of grace is called faith. And so this wonderful evidence within of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for, all of that within me, has been placed there by God, and it's on that basis that I have this wonderful connection to the wonderful benefits that are provided to me through justification by faith alone. Now that's been the topic we've had under uh, discussion now, beginning in chapter 3 verse 21 and continuing to the end of chapter 5. We've seen the essentially the heart of the matter in chapter 3. In chapter 4 we've seen a, an analysis of the character of faith, what it is, looking at Abraham as the great paradigm of that. In chapter 5, the first half, we see the effects of justification by faith. Namely, we have peace with God, access to grace, hope of glory. In the latter part of chapter 5, we see the universal need. Why is it everybody needs it? And the answer is because of that which we call original sin. We've all inherited a broken and corrupted nature 
from Adam, and that puts us in this horrible circumstance that requires the benefit that God has provided for us through this provision that comes through Christ. And that brings us now to chapter 6, verse 1, where we have a little bit of a change in the focus. Up until this time, Paul has been dealing with justification. Now he's going to shift his interest to another topic, which is definitely related, but has a slightly different uh, emphasis, and that is the notion of what's usually called sanctification. Sanctification. Sanctification comes from the Latin word sanctum, which means holy, and sanctification is that process by which we are made holy. The fact of the matter is that even though we've been justified by faith alone, God is not going to leave us in our present moral condition. He begins to go to work on us, to move us in the direction of a holy life. And that process of growing in grace, of moving toward a life of holy living, is what we usually call sanctification. And that's the topic that we have before us now. And I'd like to read, then, just taking this a paragraph at a time, beginning in chapter 6, at verse 1, the Word of God. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So there's our initial text. We'll get beyond this, of course, but let's stop right there and have a word of prayer, and then we'll get underway. Great God in heaven, we are grateful to you for the privilege that it is to count ourselves among your people and to be able to stand in this grace on the basis of faith. We thank you for the gift of faith, and we pray that now as we begin to see how faith works its way out in our lives in a process that we're calling sanctification, that you would give us insight and understanding of it, asking all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. What are we to say? Now you see, Paul knows that everything that he has just said about justification is naturally going to raise a question, and he wants to address it now. What are we going to say in light of this that we have just asserted concerning justification? Should we continue in sin so that grace may continue to abound? Some people would say so. Some people would say that because we're justified by faith alone, it therefore means we should continue to live a life of sin. Because as Paul has just said in the preceding chapter, where sin abounded, grace abounded. And so, as the argument would go, let's sin so that there may be abounding grace. Well, of course, Paul will have none of that. That's an absurdity from his point of view, but he needs to repudiate it. But notice the focus of the question he's raising. Should we continue in sin? The question is, how should we continue? We've been justified. We've been pronounced not guilty based on faith, based on the imputation of the virtue of Christ to us. We have been put right with God. Now, how should we continue? What should this life of faith look like? Should we as an option here, continue in sin on the mistaken assumption that the more we sin, the more it'll show how gracious God is. Well, of course, Paul is going to repudiate that as he does. By no means, he says, verse 2, how can we who died to sin go on living in it? And this introduces now the fundamental theme, the topic that we're going to be dealing with in chapter 6. We died to sin. Notice the change in focus. Up until this point, the interest has been in the fact that Christ died for us. Beginning here in chapter 6, the focus now changes, and it becomes, we died with Christ. And that, in and of itself, opens the door to a new conversation about a new theme, and it's this theme that we're calling sanctification. What does Paul say here? 
How can we who died to sin go on living in it? The question on the table is, shall we continue in sin so that grace may continue to increase? Well, of course, before justification, we were fully alive to sin. We were slaves to sin. We were under sin. We were trapped by sin. Sin was the context in which we lived our lives. And we were, as Paul says, dead to God. And that was our situation. Everything changed with justification. God regenerated our hearts. God changed the inward life. And that also represented a kind of death to the old. That death was accomplished in the death of Christ. The death of Christ, in some deep sense, was my death. When he died, I died, because he died for me. And from God's point of view, that death that was, died, that was uh, accomplished by Christ was a death that was accomplished by me through him. What are the effects of that? The effects of that are that I am liberated from this bondage to sin, and that's the point that Paul wants to work out in this chapter. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Now, before Paul quite explains what he means by dying to sin, that's still not quite explained by him, he wants to show us that that's precisely the significance of the right by which we were brought into the Christian fold in the first place. And so he talks about baptism now in the next two verses. Don't you know, he continues, that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? In other words, whatever it means to say we died with Christ, which is still not quite explained, the one thing we need to understand is that that's precisely what the baptismal rite stood for. It was a ritual saying we died. It's a burial ritual. Now, I realize many different denominations baptize in different ways. Some sprinkle, some pour, some dip, some immerse. And in my opinion, all of those are perfectly legitimate if they're done in the proper biblical form in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is fine. So don't get me wrong here, but I do want to make this point that those who are in the traditions that immerse really probably carry out the symbolism here more graphically than do others. Now, again, I don't mean to say that others are illegitimate. I'm just saying that the immersion really carries out this symbolism because part of what baptism stands for is death. And when you take someone and plunge them under the water, there is a kind of almost drowning rite that seems to be implied by that. They're plunged under the water as if they died at sea, as if they lost their lives there, drowning in that water. And the symbolism is to say that that is exactly what happened. That in a sense, when I come into this Christian world, this Christian experience, I am going through a dying process in which the person that I once was, in a sense, ceases to be. And there's going to be some new person coming along to take the old person's place. An old man and a new man is the way that Paul will describe it here. And he's saying, don't you understand? That's what your baptism meant. Your baptism stood for the idea that you died to an old way of life. So how can you possibly contemplate now going back and living in a, in a way of life that has become lost to you by virtue of the fact that you died? Therefore, we have been buried, Paul continues, by baptism into death. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life, a new life a new person. Death to the old, resurrection to the new. Baptism is something like a funeral. When you go to a funeral, you say goodbye to somebody who has departed. And there's a sense in which if somebody came and attended your baptism, they might do the same thing. They might say goodbye to the person you once were. That person is dead and gone. There is somebody else, of course, walking around now who looks like you, who you know, dresses maybe the way you did and so on. But this person now is a new person. In Christian history, it's been occasionally the case that a new name, a Christian name is given to a person at the point of their baptism just to reinforce that there's a new human being on the scene and the old person now is dead and gone. 
That's what baptism stands for. And of course, Paul is now simply raising the logical question, how can you contemplate continuing in that former way of life when in fact everything about Christian conversion stands for a radical disjunction between the old and the new? And you've been raised to new life in Christ, and baptism stood for that as well. Now Paul, in beginning in verse 5, begins to put under the microscope precisely what he means by this expression to die with Christ. So let's just read this. We'll take it a little bit at a time as we work through it. He says, if we have been united with him in a death like his, so that's our dying with Christ, we will certainly, he continues, be united with him in a resurrection like his. So notice that Paul in verse 5 has now set up a kind of retrospective and prospective understanding. There's something that happened in the past, there's something that's going to happen in the future. The thing that happened in the past, Paul says, is that we died. We have been united with him in a death like his. And then he says, we look forward to being united with him in a resurrection like his. A death like his, a resurrection like his. Past, future. The first thing Paul now takes up is this past event. What happened there? Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him. Now the way that happened is because that's what God has achieved. When Christ died, he died in my place. And so his death is reckoned by God as my death. Whatever Christ endured on the cross is considered to be what I endured through him on the cross. If Christ paid the penalty that was owing by me, requiring a, an eternity in hell under the wrath of God, if that's what Christ did, then it's as if I have spent my eternity in hell under the wrath of God. You see, it, it, everything that was achieved by Christ has been reckoned by God as having been achieved by me, but it's all through him. So Paul is saying now in verse 6, my old self, that person I was prior to my Christian conversion, that old person was crucified, put to death, sent to hell, buried, end of story, so that the body of sin might be destroyed. Now that's an odd expression, but the meaning Paul has is simply this. My body had been the possession of sin. Before my Christian conversion, I was a slave to sin. The passions of sin raged in my body. I was unable to resist its impulses. I was able, unable to keep from sinning. And that body, as a possession of sin, was the result of the judgment that came against me, part of the package we call original sin. That's the whole point of chapter 5. As the result of Adam's sin, all of these sinful problems attached to me. Slavery to sin, I became a sinner, death reigned. All of these things became the baggage that was attached to me by virtue of the sin of Adam. It's all part of his judgment. It's all part of God's judgment against Adam and his race. But do you see that if I have paid everything that justice requires, I am freed, I'm freed from the judgment of original sin. My body is no longer the possession of sin. It's powered down is the sense of this Greek word. Katergao, uh, it's a word means uh, the, the body of sin might be powered down. That is, there's a sense in which my body is no longer under the, under the energetic forces of sinfulness within me. Why? Because I was crucified when Christ was crucified. I've been released from that judgment that we described in chapter 5 so that, Paul says, we may, would, might no longer be enslaved to sin. You see, I was a slave to sin. Augustine said we were uh, unable to keep from sinning. Non posse non peccari. Unable to keep from sinning. That changes with regeneration. That changes with justification because that was a prison that I'd been thrown into as part of God's judgment. But the judgment of God has been satisfied. Justice has been 
provided for, and I'm free to leave that prison. So it's no longer essential, necessary, or desirable that I be a slave to sin. I've been freed from sin. This is the great news of being a Christian. We have, through the death of Christ, been liberated from our slavery to sin. It is no longer unavoidable that you sin. Now, we do sin. It does continue to happen because we're in a process of sanctification. But the very reason sanctification can happen is because we have fundamentally been freed from sin and now we need to learn new ways of life, new habits, to replace the way that we once lived. Because as Paul continues, verse 7, whoever has died is freed from sin. If you are dead, you are freed from sin. If you're dead, you've been freed from sin, and you have died. In Christ, the penalty has been paid, and you are liberated. This is you know, the best news I could possibly imagine that I could be able to deliver to you. If you've never thought of it before, then this is the time to think about it. You are liberated. You have been freed from sin. You have been freed to become the person you really want to be. You have had all of that straitjacket of slavery to your own whims and vices, broken. It's been left behind you and the prison door is swung open and you can walk out because the death of Christ has been applied to you and your slavery to sin has therefore been broken. So that's the good news about what happened in the past. Our death with Christ is a liberation from sin and that's why it's absurd to say should we go on sinning so that grace may why would we do such a thing? We've been freed from sin. The great tyrant who made our lives miserable, who caused us to do all kinds of things that we regretted later. That tyrant has been broken. And now we can walk forth in a newness of life. The rest of it begins in verse 8, in which now Paul turns his attention to the future. If we've been with Christ in his death, we will be with him in his resurrection. We believe, Paul says, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. It's an article of faith. If you have been crucified with Christ, then you will be raised with him. If one, then the other. Nobody drops off. Nobody falls off the rails here. Anybody who has been crucified with Christ in the front end is going to be raised with him on the back end. And we are in this in-between time right now between our history and our destiny. And we're looking forward to a destiny that involves this great, wonderful truth of resurrection. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And you see, if it's true of Christ, it's true of you. This is the whole point Paul's driving at. If death has no more dominion over Christ, then insofar as you were crucified with Christ, death has no more dominion over you. If Christ is raised from the dead, you will certainly be raised from the dead. In some sense, you already have been by regeneration. It's already begun. There's already new life within you, and it's working its way through you and leading ultimately to your resurrection, which will certainly take place. And that great destiny inspires us day by day with great joy. The death he died, Paul says, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. The death he died was a death you died. You have died to sin once for all. And the life that Christ lives is now the life that you live. You live in newness of life. You're alive to God. The life of God courses through you, through the Holy Spirit. And this becomes a new way for you to approach life. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And that becomes the very nature of the life of the Christian person, to live in the wonderful energies of the resurrection of Christ himself, because you are participating in that just as surely as you participated in his death. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is really the first time Paul has told us to do anything in the book of Romans. Everything so far has been didactic. He's been teaching us truth about our circumstance as a Christian person. And now for the first time in the book, he's telling us to do something. And the thing that he tells us to do is simply to consider to be true what actually is the case. Reckon yourselves to be dead to sin because you are. Reckon yourselves to be alive to God because you are. Well, how do you do that? How do you reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God? 
Paul gives us really the heart of the matter in verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Then, Paul says, sin will not domineer you because you are not under law but under grace. Parastasize, the Greek word, it means to present as a sacrifice. It's the same word Paul uses in chapter 12 when he says, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. It means to put your life out there as a sacrificial surrender to God. That's how you do it. Don't present your members as slaves to sin. And how do you keep from doing that? How do you avoid that negative you do it by replacing it with this very affirmative command, present yourselves to God. Every day the Christian starts off, gets on his knees in the morning, or gets on her knees in the morning, and says to God, Lord, you are my King and Lord. I surrender everything in my life to you. Everything. Past, present, future. My possessions, my family, my job, my prospects, my health, my wealth. All of it, the whole package of all that falls within the province of my life, I surrender to you absolutely, categorically, no strings attached, nothing held back, a complete and total release of all that I am, all that I have, every breath I take into your care. You can dispose of it as you wish, because I am but a slave to you, and yet that slavery to you is my very doorway to freedom. As you present yourself in that way, as a sacrifice to God, you're going to find a remarkable thing happens. You are no longer domineered by sin. Many Christian people live in a kind of false slavery to bad habits, to sinful vices, because they are still holding out. They're still doing something less than presenting themselves to God. And to the degree you do not surrender yourself to God, you are an idolater. You shall have no other gods before me, the first commandment. And what that means is that he is the one who absolutely owns you and commands you. And the only rational thing for you to do in the face of that great truth is to surrender yourself to him. This is the first great lesson of sanctification. It's the lesson of releasing our claim to ourselves utterly and totally and placing it in the care of God who loves us and who only wants the best for us and who will as a result of that lead us increasingly, inexorably toward the wonderful prospect of holiness and eventually of glory. Well, that's the first half of chapter 6. We're going to continue next time with the distortions of sanctification that Paul begins to describe for us, antinomianism on the one hand, legalism on the other, and we'll be taking those up in our next uh, session together. Until then, may God richly bless you.